Good afternoon and welcome to Audio Tree Live. Today is Thursday, November 12th, 2015, and we're honored to have with us in the studio John Mark Nelson.
Watching Audio Tree Live. We're in the studio with John Mark Nelson. What's up, you guys? Uh, thank you so much for coming out and performing for us. The whole time I was drinking that coffee during the first set, I was just thinking, should I be having this coffee right now? <laughs> for some reason, <laughs> in my head was there. Uh, would you explain to me uh, the pedal board clock? I've just never seen it before. <laughs> Is that a gift or something you came up with? Or? A festive gift? Yeah. Um, yeah, I put that on there. I cut a watch. I like the straps off a watch. Yeah, I yeah. put that in there so if suddenly you get an angry stage manager from side stage say five more minutes or we're cutting you off then you can like pay i can attention look to down it. and in theory be able to in the heat of the moment and in the stress of the stage manager yelling at you be able to tell time manually okay sure but that works mm, 10 percent some of the time. percentage yeah. of the time <laughs> yeah the totally right yeah <laughs> so, i was hoping you wouldn't ask about that <laughs> Because I don't even know if it works or it's on time. I think it is on time. He I used to have a compass, but it just wasn't as <laughs> useful. It didn't do it. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. It's like, well, I'm facing north, but does that really make me perform better? I don't know. Turns Maybe. out it does. Yeah, yeah, it turns out always. Um, I'm curious about, uh, you started out on drums before, uh, like when you were younger, or you grew up playing drums? Or? Yeah, um, so my first, my first instrument, I played... Uh, drum set for about five or six years. That was my first instrument that I ever studied. I had, I okay. had a fascination with music and kind of was around music growing up, uh, but drum set was the first thing that I picked up the lesson book and the sticks and went and actually took lessons. Right. And it's, to this day, it's the only instrument I've ever, I've ever studied in that manner. Okay. But I think it just helped me kind of realize my fascination for music in a more academic sense and then helped my writing and producing later on. I don't play a whole lot these days, um, but it, it was definitely something that kind of helped me fall in love with music. Yeah, when you're thinking about drums for your own band or even listening to other music, I mm -hmm. mean, I assume that factors in pretty largely to the sound, right? Yeah. The drums are important to you, probably. Yeah, absolutely. I, when, I, when I start to write, a lot of times I start with, with drum and bass, just grooves and kind of write on top of that. Interesting. Rather than putting that in later. So uh, right. the feel and the groove kind of influences a lot of, of how I write and, and the method of that and the, the, the layers and how they stack and... Just the, the the order of events, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Sure. Yeah. Do you have a specific sound that you're going for? I just mean, like, texturally, or are there certain um, aspects of a drum kit that you like more in your music? That's, that's a good question. Yeah, I think sometimes I'll be able to listen to a record and hear, like, oh, that, that's really interesting what they did with that drum sound. I wonder how they did that with where they put the mic or what gear they ran it through mm -hmm. and stuff. So a lot of times I'm looking for both the groove and the sound. You know, I sure. like want the tom to sound this way or the snare to sound right, this way, right, something right. like that. But, um, yeah, I, I love I love hearing drummers. Nate's obviously a fantastic drummer, and I'm honored to play with him. And... Um, yeah, watching drummers, listening to drummers, I love it. <laughs> yeah, who, who are some other guys that you like, whether just like your buddies or, I don't know, people sure. you look up to that are professionals? Man. Anybody want to chime in? Yeah, yeah. Others. we got lots of great players in Minneapolis yeah, for in sure. the Twin Cities area. Uh, I remember on your first interview we did, you talked about how much you love Dave King, who's yeah, a big love, Minnesota guy. Yeah, I love Dave King's playing. He's a little more on the out there side, but he's a, such a fantastic player and fantastic musician. He's a writer as well and okay. a composer and um, he's a fantastic drummer uh, that was kind of rooted in the Twin Cities. Uh, named Steve Gould, okay. a fantastic Holler. player. He yeah. was my he was my teacher for many years actually. Yeah. Oh sweet, we yeah. like his playing. Right on. He's a Minnesota expat. He's in Arizona now. Okay, yeah. Yeah, he used to play with like Owl City and Sarah Bareilles and different stuff like that. And he's a he's a cool guy. What would you say like stands out? Maybe as a, two drummers here, but anyone else stands out about his playing specifically? He's about a Steve? robot. Yeah, <laughs> Steve. Steve he's is robot. Uh, yeah, he's uh, he's a guy who can bring a ton of energy uh, just by you know just by sitting at the instrument. He just Lights on fire. It's sure. awesome. Um, yeah, Steve. Steve's the man. I love that guy. Cool. Yeah, right on. Uh, thanks again, you guys, for coming out, Sharon. Uh, you can take it away with your next one when you're ready. Awesome. Thanks. I'm gonna tune quick. 
Yeah, and I can say that um, they're taking a break for the rest of the year as far as touring goes, but in spring uh, there will be a tour so you can hang out on their uh, social media pages and see when that's going to be announced. And the new LP, I'm Not Afraid, which you can uh, look right over there for the sign, the title right there. You can get it in stores and online. This is a song called Control. Audio Tree Live. We're in the studio with John Mark Nelson. Anyone that needs to change up or tune up, you can go ahead and do that. Um, yeah, if you need to flip guitars there. I'm curious, uh, you guys are all in Minneapolis or thereabouts. Um, just insight on what you think is special about music in the Midwest. Um, or maybe, uh, yeah, yeah. what do you think is special about music in the Midwest? Yeah, I... I uh I feel really grateful that people outside of Minneapolis and the Twin Cities and even outside of the Midwest are starting to ask that question because I think from the music that's coming out of it, from the people that are coming out of it, I think people are starting to go, oh, the Midwest, like there's there's cool things going yeah, on there. And yeah. Chicago, obviously very well included in that. But for my experience, you know, I don't know the Chicago scene as well, but for the Twin Cities um, music community, I feel like so many, um, so many communities out there, whether it's Nashville, L.A. or New York or something like that, 
Um, it's very much um, kind of like a, how do I measure up against other bands? How do I measure up against other instrumentalists? That kind of thing. And it's more about like, what can I do to kind of just keep climbing, sure. climbing the rock wall, just a hold here, a hold there. Sure. Um, and it's it's very competition based. It seems where it's you know it's all about oh my gosh could that band be better than me? Is that songwriter better than me? And I think what what we've managed to at least uh, start to cultivate in the Midwest and in the Twin Cities is um, a community and collaborative style art community where mm-hmm. rather than people being terrified that there's another band that sounds similar to them or writes great songs, they figure out how they can help them or how hey we could share a bill together you know yeah. we could do a show together we could do a tour together. Um, so it feels like we're all really rooting for one another because sure. I think we value and treasure the place that we live and we really want to see it have a place in the national community, in the international community. So I think rooting for one another and encouraging one another so that the Midwest has a place on the map and people go, oh, another Midwest band, that's 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 going to be good. That's going to be sure. a treat. You know? So I think we're really, we really want the best for our community, which in turn means for one another. Yeah, um, and I, I'm grateful to be a part of something that functions that way. Yeah, do you think that that comes from a little bit of um, I don't know, like cityism or, or like a city pride, things like that? Like like you're proud of the area you're from, so you want them to be represented well across the globe. Yeah, I think that's definitely part of it. I think it's it's both that you know we believe in where we live, and it's also we believe in one another. So we want to see mm-hmm. people from the Midwest go out and do things because they're from the Midwest, but also just because we like them as people and as artists. Mm-hmm. So I think it's it's both. Sure. Yeah. Others um, inside on that, or yeah, I was thinking that it, a lot of it has to do with geography too. Like Minneapolis is relatively isolated, you right? Know, compared to somewhere like New right. York City that has Boston, Philadelphia, all those other major cities so close by. Because we're even seven hours from Chicago, right? Exactly. Right? Exactly. Yeah. A seven-hour drive is like the next major, major market, kind mm-hmm. of. So, the fact that we're relatively isolated, I think it kind of, we're kind of. Um, drawn inward a little bit more right? and looking at all the stuff going on in the city because we can't really go to many other places. Right, yeah, that's an interesting <laughs> point. There's not even the ability uh, to connect outward. It's a lot harder. We have to, you have to make a much more deliberate effort to do that. Well, we so. can go hang out with Sioux Falls anytime we want. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not to slight Sioux Falls. We, we no, go to Sioux, Sioux Falls, Falls relatively no. often, and we like it there. Yeah, Sioux Falls I'm saying is... saying that literally. We do. We, that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Sioux, Falls. Sioux Falls is, like, blowing up size-wise. Yeah. It's growing a lot, and there's a lot of job opportunity out there and a lot of people moving from, uh, like, right after college out there. I'm from northwest Iowa, like, the corner, so I know like, a bunch of my friends right after college went to Sioux Falls. It's actually a really sweet town. Yeah, we love it. We've played there a couple times. It's yeah. fun. Uh, other stuff just about that. Um, anyone else want to say something about I think there's just a, a pride for surviving the winter in Minnesota. Right, though, honestly. <laughs> yeah, and it just gets just scary cold, and you're like, maybe this is it. Uh, but each year it comes back around, and you're still schlepping gear and driving the truck around to play shows, and everyone feels a little pride and appreciation for the work we put in, Yeah, I think. Yeah, maybe that's it. I mean, maybe by the time you expend the energy of bringing your amp and your drum set across town in a Minnesota blizzard, yeah. you have no energy to have any competition. For yeah, it's bands. just yeah. you've got to love you've them. You've sort of given up at that point. Yeah. <laughs> and the audience is there. They're like, yeah, we said we were coming to a show, like <laughs> snowing, raining, like we're here. We're here to see We'd you. We'd better just stay. <laughs> <laughs> It is true, though, there was some uh, national survey uh, detailing like how much it rains, how big the um, humidity difference is, that kind of thing, and Minneapolis won, or I guess in some senses lost, yeah. for yeah. the most difficult. Raise the roof. Yeah. <laughs> so good for you guys. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. the, Come okay. visit any time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can roll into your next one when you're ready, guys. Cool. There's a tune called Dream Last Night.
Audio Tree Live. We're in the studio with John Mark Nelson. Again, go ahead and switch up if you need to, guys. Um, I'm curious, John Mark, uh, what what prompted the choice of change in style a little bit um, on the new record? Not, not that you've left everything from your old material behind or anything, but it's definitely not as folk focused. And you're playing electric guitar, which is just a simple change. Right. You know? Absolutely. Um, so the change occurred, I think, as naturally as possible. Uh, sure. It, 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 Definitely wasn't the type of thing where I sat down and said, oh, you know what, throwing out the old playbook, no more mandolin, no more string quartet. I think it's just when I sat down to write, um, I just found that a different palette was exciting to me. So okay. where it was super exciting to like have a song and open up a uh, composing software and like write out a string quartet part, which is still something I really love. I just really enjoyed experimenting with like, uh, more vocal interplay, a lot more driven by the songs driven by the bass and the drums mm -hmm. as opposed to the acoustic guitar or my voice. Um, messing around with some funky um, electric guitar sounds. I mean, Steve's Steve's got some funky things going on over there. Yeah, and, and the fun thing is, is this band right here is the actual band that tracked the record. Sweet. And we and we tracked it like this, just kind of in a room, looking at each other, doing everything live. We dubbed we dubbed a couple layers over the top, but for the most part, it was it was done like this, which is I think gives it the energy. Mm -hmm. Whereas the older records were tracked all in little little fragments, so sure. it's, it's hard to kind of build that unified sound when the record is tracked over a period of two years. <laughs> right, because you're laying them on top of each other, but they're still isolated when they right. were recorded. Right, right. so yeah. you could, like, I could, my vocal part for one song may have been recorded a, a year and a half after I mm. recorded the first demo. Right. On. So by that, that point, you know, you've kind of lost that initial excitement of, like, creating something in a moment. Mm -hmm. And so we did this whole record in, in two days. <laughs> Dang. Um, we went into the into the studio Monday morning, and we were out Tuesday at lunch. Uh, at least the band was, and then Kara and I stayed, and Steve. We did some layering and stuff, but like the the core of what you hear for the whole record, we did in a, I guess a day and a half, really, not even two full days. Right so, on. Um, but what prompted the change, I think, was just new things were exciting when I sat down to write. Mm -hmm. So not not a deliberate choice, but just kind of reacting to what was really energizing to me. Yeah, and so then seeking out. How did the process of seeking out these guys to help you come about? Well, the great thing was is that between the last record and this record is when the, this group here kind of came together okay. and solidified. So by the time I had the songs written, I already had, kind of had these guys in mind Got because it. we had been on the road. And I think another thing that influenced the new sound is that going out and playing live, you kind of realize what's really fun to play and what translates really well. Yeah, to right people. on. Yeah. And so to me, it's like I wanted to make a a playable record that we could just sit set up like this in a room and we could just play track one to track 10. You know, mm -hmm. when the last record, 
it was really tough to travel with the 56 musicians necessary <laughs> to make it happen. We couldn't have, we didn't have the budget for the oboe. We didn't you have bought the, the bus, the but it, they just couldn't all fit the in. Bass clarinet, we tried a couple different 15 passenger vans, but that wasn't quite enough because where do you put the gear? So yeah, I mean, it's like they all have to eat. Yeah, they all have to eat. You know, they need the a per diem place. was ridiculous. What I was paying out of pocket. 56 um, is a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to make a record that we could play as five people in a room, just like you would in a rehearsal space or in your parents' garage or whatever, just a record that you could play. Right on, man. Sweet. Okay, and uh, you can get that record, I'm Not Afraid, online, in stores, and take it away when you guys are ready. Yeah, I just want to say before we start this tune, thank you for having us. We're so, so honored to be here. This is really, really fun. So I really appreciate it. This uh, song we're going to leave you with is called That's What You Do. Audio Tree Live. We've been in the studio with John Mark Nelson. 
get their new record and check them out on tour next year. Thank you guys very much for performing for us and hanging Thank out. You. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks so much. Thanks to awesome people in the studio and sound engineers, camera and lighting crew, hooking it up, and viewers. Thanks for watching. You can support the band by downloading the session when it comes out in a couple of weeks and send a shout via social media to us or the band if you just want to connect. From all of us here at the Audio Tree Studio, thanks for tuning in. Goodbye. <laughs>